Hello, welcome back to The Rest is History. Um, we promised you before the break the death of Weimar. And Dominic, I, I mean, there's a terrible, tragic sense in which kind of Weimar dies of the very political complications with, with which it's been wrestling throughout its existence. The Nazis don't storm to power wielding guns or marching on the capital or anything like that. They do it by means of backroom deals, election gambits, all the kind of things that we would recognize from a functioning democracy, but they're doing it with the aim of, of, of terminating democracy. And this is the issue with which in the 21st century, certainly in the 2010s and 2020s, people have started to wrestle, isn't it? What do you do in a democracy with somebody who is competing, who is playing, you know, as a contestant, but is determined to destroy the very game in which they are playing? How do you, how do you exclude them? How do you control them? Do you try to tame them? Do you work with them? Would you just say never? So this is the problem that is facing the, and of course, for the Weimar parliamentarians, they have no precedent. You know, they, there is no... Right. Yes. So, so for us, this is the paradigmatic political morality story, but they yeah. didn't have that morality story. I mean, I no. suppose the only morality story they would have would be the end of the Roman Republic, something like that. But I don't think people are making that comparison, actually, in the... Well, some are. Um, so uh, the Roman Revolution, the famous book by Syme about the collapse of the Roman Republic is yes. being written against exactly this backdrop. Yes, that's a very good point, Tom. So I think I think people are kind of vaguely aware of it, but obviously it's inadequate to compare to the moral yeah. horror uh, for us. So, yeah, I mean, I think that is always a really important thing to bear in mind when looking at this story is that we have the example of the Nazi takeover, but people living through the Nazi takeover obviously didn't. Yeah, so, so almost none of the characters that we're going to meet in the second half take the Nazis seriously. They just don't see, they haven't, they maybe haven't read Mein Kampf. They see them as violent clowns who they can use. So Chancellor Heinrich Brüning, the sort of austere Catholic um, British Railways enthusiast who we talked about in the first half, he has now has no real chance of a majority. And in fact, there is no majority for anything at all in the Reichstag from September 1930 onwards. So increasingly in the next few years, you see it endlessly being suspended or adjourned, or when it does meet, it's just a lot of shouting and and um, sort of disputation. And so how is the country being governed? So it's being governed by decree. Brüning is governing it by decree using Hindenburg. So basically the way that works is the Reich Chancellor, which is Brüning, goes to President Hindenburg and says, under Article 48, you know, I would like you to do this. And Hindenburg basically says yes. And who is kind of holding the strings of who? Well, this is always a little bit unclear. Everybody is trying to pull the strings of everybody else. And here there's a really interesting character enters the story. So there's a rising figure who's a kind of intermediary between politics and the army. And this is a chap called General Kurt von Schleicher. He's a Prussian, you'll be surprised to hear, uh, born in 1882. Uh, he's clever. He's a great intriguer. Everybody knows that Schleicher loves intrigue. He's always sort of whispering in back rooms. He's a very political general. He's worked his way up the ladder. Um, I read in the Bodleian Library, Tom, uh, it says Schleicher was well known for his sense of humor, his lively conversational skills, his sharp wit, and his habit of abandoning his upper class aristocratic accent to speak his German with a salty working class Berlin accent full of risque phrases that many found either charming or vulgar. So I read that on Wikipedia, so it's almost certainly not true. Um, but but it's a nice it's a nice nice pen portrait, isn't it? It's a nice pen portrait. Trotsky, of all people, said Schleicher was a question mark with the epaulets of a general. That's a very good quote. Um, he's a Prussian general who's just scheming the whole time. Too clever by half. But everybody knows it. This is the trouble. Yeah. yeah. What he seems to want is a military dictatorship of some kind, an authoritarian vehicle, and he is playing off Hindenburg. Um, the politicians, he's, he's talking to the Nazis quite early on. Presumably the example of Bismarck is, is hanging over this. Is I it? suppose he might see himself as a bit of a Bismarck. I mean, what the army wants is they want a government that will allow, that will basically, they, they won't be bothered by politicians anymore. They'll be able to rearm and make Germany great again. Yeah. Yeah. Get out the tanks. And that probably will involve wars. But I don't think people in the army think, let's wage a massive world war and take on all the, you know, all the old allies again for round two. They, they think, let's fight the Poles and get, yeah. you know, Danzig. Have a, have a crack at the Czechs. Exactly. That's, and, and we'll feel good about ourselves. I think that's what they, they, they're after. Now, Hinden, President Hindenburg is 84. His uh, presidential term is up in 1932. Um, he, he toys with standing down. 
but such is the sort of chaos and confusion of the time that it's fairly easy for his advisor to persuade him to stand again. So now we have this crazy situation where Hindenburg, the epitome of the Prussian reactionary, is standing again for the presidency. And his two big rivals in the second round, so the first round is sort of ambiguous, and so this goes to a second round. His two big rivals are Telman, the leader of the communists, and Hitler, the leader of the Nazis. So what that means, it's a, it's a bit like <laughs> yeah. a supercharged version of those kind of Macron-Le Pen or Chirac-Le Pen elections, where loads of people who normally would hate the mainstream person have to hold their nose and vote for them because they can't stand the extremist alternatives. Because Hindenburg, who hates Weimar, yeah. is now is now the, the, the candidate for Weimar. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly. The Social Democrats, um, they describe him as the embodiment of calm and constancy, of manly loyalty and devotion to duty, a man who's on whose work one can build, a man of pure desire and serene judgment. I mean, that's a bonkers thing Madness. to say, because yeah. Hindenburg regards, thinks the Social Democrats are absolute, you know. And they he, know it. He, yeah, he holds them in very low regard. So it goes to a second ballot. And for the first time, Hitler, the Nazis import American-style campaign techniques. So this is where he, he gets on planes, isn't he? He gets on a plane. For the first and, time. And, yeah. and this is the interesting thing, isn't it, about the Nazis, about fascism generally, how it's simultaneously backward-looking and incredibly futuristic. So same with Mussolini, love it. Yeah. Planes and cars and things, yeah. Ma ma men of action. So Hitler yeah. in his sort of raincoat is always leaping on and off aeroplanes and going to address huge crowds that, of course, Goebbels has, with his, his bohemian theatricality, has kind of prepped them with all kinds of bands and displays and spectacle and all this kind of thing. People are very, very excited by this. If they're very good at democracy. Right. I mean, that's 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 the, the weird thing. The, that's the, the irony of it. They they they're deploying all kinds of tricks and techniques that are still being deployed to this day. Yeah, I guess that I guess that's true. I mean, as we said last time, if you watch uh, Lenny Riefenstahl Triumph of the Will, you watch Nazi rallies. You know, do political party conferences in Britain or American presidential conventions in the United States? Do they learn those techniques? Of course, they do. They absolutely do. So Hitler gets 37% in that presidential election, 13 million votes. Hindenburg um, gets 53%. That's actually pretty weak by Hindenburg, given he is the titanic war hero. And he's got almost all the, the sort of the conventional parties behind him. And actually, in some parts of the Protestant countryside, Schleswig-Holstein, Pomerania, Hitler actually wins. Hitler beats Hindenburg. Such is the sense of of anger about the depression and desperation for something new. So it's pretty clear that the, the wind is in the Nazi sails. And actually, Bruning, who's still hanging around, um, who's been, I think it's fair, to, I, I don't actually, Richard Evans, for example, is very harsh on Bruning. He just regards Bruning as an absolute waste of space. I think that's a tiny bit harsh, but it's fair to say Bruning has made a series of very bad decisions. He basically gets booted out at the end of May 1932. So now... Hindenburg needs a new chancellor. He's, he's not going to pick Hitler. Hitler's an extremist, a rabble rouser, a demagogue, a mere corporal. He's not going to pick Hitler. What he, he picks a man, the ultimate sort of establishment man, and this is a chap called Franz von Papen. Well, you've give, got a brilliant description in your notes. Looks like a greyhound or a man from the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> yeah, there's people listening from the Daily Telegraph. I don't know, do they look like greyhounds? Maybe they do. Well, you're so, thinking of Charles Moore, someone like that. Yeah, I actually, you know, kind you know of the tall, columnist, thin, angular. Do you know the columnist Tim Stanley? Yes, I knew Tim Stanley when he was a very young man. Uh, I think Franz von Papen looks like a, an older, more Germanic version of Tim Stanley. Tim Stanley has quite vibrant hair. Yeah, bouffant, I would say. Bouffant hair. Tom, uh, does does, uh, no. does Franz von Papen? No, but there's something in the features. I can't okay, really describe right. it. Okay. Listen, okay. I mean, this is of no use to most people who don't know who either <laughs> of these people are. But anyway, um, it's good to find light amid the darkness. Uh, Papen is a, an aristocrat. He's from the Catholic Centre Party. Again, very Catholic. Bizarrely, he had been expelled from the United States for spying during the First World War. Um, he married the daughter of a rich industrialist. He's rich, so he's rich. He's very well connected. He's posh. Um, he knows everybody. He has contacts. So he's in very, every... very different to Hitler then. 
completely different, I utterly mean, different. Uh, yeah. Um, he knows lots of people in the army. He knows lots of people in politics and big business. Uh, interestingly, we talked about Bruning and, and uh, our old chum, Antonio Salazar, um, from the Portuguese episodes. Franz von Papen has a lot of this going on as well. It, there's a sort of Catholic political authoritarianism very common in Europe in the 1920s and 1930s. I mean, von Papen and the people around him actually talk about a new state, which is the same, you know, they call it the Estado Novo in Portugal. They dream of this kind of Catholic order returning to Germany. Of course, it's never going to happen because there's so many Protestants in Germany. But anyway, Hindenburg makes him chancellor and he fills his cabinet with other people like him. So people call it the cabinet of barons. I mean, some <laughs> people call it the cabinet of experts, which is very sort of anti-Gove. But I think the cabinet of barons is a better... That's much funnier. I mean, I suppose darkly funny. Well, you'd think of a baron as kind of ruthlessly efficient, wouldn't you? But these barons are yes. all... I mean, they're like the Red loose. Baron. Yeah. Van Papen is in. I think it's fair to say he, like General Schleicher, He's an intriguer, and I don't believe he has the slightest idea how to get Germany out of the mess that it is in. An effete Machiavelli, yeah, uh, Burley that, describes him as. That is brilliant. I mean, that is exactly what he's a dilettante. He's he's a man from the Daily Telegraph. There's a brilliant example in Richard Evans's book. He says one of Papen's great initiatives is to abolish the guillotine, which has been used since the French Revolution, because he regards it as too newfangled, and to replace it with the traditional Prussian handheld axe for executions. That's very I mean, Daily Telegraph, isn't it? Very Daily Telegraph, <laughs> but it's absolutely not Germany's priority in no. 1932. No. Papen and Schleicher, so they team up for the time being. The intriguing general and the intriguing um, effete, what was he in effete? Machiavelli. Yet again, they persuade President Hindenburg to dissolve the Reichstag and call new elections. I mean, why people keep on doing this? This is a great error. I mean, even though the sort well, of more that's the definition of famously, the definition of insanity is to keep repeating the same mistake over and over again, expecting it to come out. Differently. I mean, it's, it's 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 strange when you read the accounts, especially by kind of you know sort of left leaning historians like Richard Evans, who keep saying. They keep basically saying, why do they not just prorogue the parliament forever and impose some kind of authoritarian rule? Why do they keep making these terrible mistakes? Anyway, they because do presumably this. presumably the, the alternatives, as we now see, is a kind of authoritarian military dictatorship or the yeah. Nazis. And yeah. because we know which is the worst of those. Yeah, you're right. We're tempted to see it as as the worst of all fates, but they, you know, to repeat, they don't know that, do you're they? You're right, of course. But they're also, I mean, they do want a military dictatorship, but they're kind of frightened that they won't get to do it themselves, that somebody else will take it over. They're also frightened of alarming the public and provoking civil war. So they want to get, they want to put themselves in a position where nobody, there won't be anybody in the street complaining, where everybody would be delighted, where they've got maybe backing in the Reichstag for it. They call new elections. They think, they, they're conscious of Hitler and his strength, and they think to themselves, listen, we don't want to really alienate him. So they lift, there's been a ban on the stormtroopers marching openly. They say, we'll lift this ban because this will appease him, buy him off and maybe what make him What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Well, almost immediately in July 1932, there's enormous fighting in a place called Altona in Prussia, which is near Hamburg, between the stormtroopers and the communist Red Front. And 18 people are killed and hundreds of people are injured because the police lose control and they start shooting wildly. And Papen then makes another of these terrible, terrible mistakes. Instead of doing what he should have done, which is to ban all the paramilitaries completely, he, he thinks, great, I can use this as an opportunity to seize control of the state government of Prussia. So Prussia is by far, Prussia is the England of Germany. It dominates Germany. It's by far the biggest state. If you control Prussia, you don't quite control the lot, but you're a lot of the way there. And Prussia is run by the Social Democrats. And basically, von Papen and Hindenburg dissolve by emergency decree the Social Democratic. They take over the Social Democratic government of Prussia. They kick out the Social Democrats from their great stronghold. And von Papen will use this. Um, as his own personal fiefdom. And this is a disaster for democracy because here you have the central government unconstitutionally effectively getting rid of the biggest party and the, and the social democrats do nothing to resist it. Why do they not resist it? Because they're worried about civil war as well. They are exactly the social democrats are paralyzed. But they've been a bit, they've, they've been paralyzed the whole way through, haven't they? I mean, they've been they kind have. of sitting there waiting for the revolution to come and nothing ever happens. 
it's that, but also they've known from the very beginning of Weimar that lots of people in the army don't like them, that there are lots of reactionaries who think they're illegitimate. I mean, they've known this from even before the First World War. And at this key moment, they do nothing. They don't have a general strike. They're being robbed of their heartland. You know, I'm trying to imagine an analogous situation. It's as though there was an elected English government that the Westminster Parliament suddenly kicked out and said, we'll run it ourselves, you know, and in a context of street violence. And that government did nothing to about it. Didn't say, oi, you know, that this is illegal. Take to the streets, have a general strike or something. So and I said they can't have a general strike because unemployment is so high that, you know, people aren't going to down tools to go out on the streets. So as, as Richard Evans says, Parpin's coup dealt a mortal blow to the Weimar Republic. It destroyed the federal principle and opened the way to the wholesale centralization of the state. Which the Nazis are all about. Of course. Because if you have a Fuhrer. So if the Nazis ever do take power, they can follow that precedent. So the election. This election in July 1932 that von Papen has called um, takes place in a context of where we began with Horst Wessel and the street violence. This is now worse than ever before. So Hitler is again flying around, addressing different venues. The the propaganda is more aggressive than ever. I mean, Richard Evans is brilliant on this, actually. He says, um, every poster, no matter what party it's for, basically looks the same. It's a, it's a giant, half-naked male worker smashing his adversaries. He says, all over Germany, electors were confronted with violent images of giant workers smashing their opponents to pieces, kicking them aside, yanking them out of parliament, or looming over frock-coated and top-hatted politicians who are almost universally portrayed as insignificant and quarrelsome pygmies. And of course, if everybody's doing that, it plays into the hands of the people who do it best. Of course, yeah. And that's the Nazis. Yeah. So they run, yet again, they say... And and the Nazis are saying... What, what is their policy? What is their policy to their political opponents? Are they saying, we'll put them in concentration camps? We'll ban them? Are, are they they They're that? never so explicit. They're never so explicit. They talk in abstractions. They say, we'll end the parliamentary pygmies and their okay. you know, bickering. National unity, national rebirth, down with the Jewish financiers, down with the communists, down with the November Right, criminals. but when they say down with the communists, what are they saying they're going to do to the communists? They're not, they're, they're not specific. They're never specific. So if, even if you read Mein Kampf, Tom, I mean, Hitler is all generalities. It's all kind of the language of the, the medical language that we've talked about a lot in this series, or, or the sort of slightly religious language that you are obviously familiar with from your stuff with Horst Wessel. You know, that sort of um, talk of the talk of rebirth and national salvation. It's all that sort of stuff. And, and, and the, that election, 31st of July, it is an absolute disaster for the mainstream and a victory for the extremes. So the Nazis double their vote, six to 13 million. They're now by far the biggest single party in the Reichstag, 230 seats. The communists also increase their vote. They're on 89 seats. There is a sense, however, this is as good as it will ever get for the Nazis. You know, this was their greatest. That they've hit, they've hit the glass ceiling. They've probably hit a ceiling. So even Goebbels in his diary says, you know, we've got 37% of the vote. It's probable we've got as many people who will ever vote for us in a kind of free election. So this is the point at which we should become a party of power. We should enter government. The issue is that they they don't want to enter government as anybody else's partner. Well, because Hitler can't, can he? If he's no, you're right. Proclaiming himself the Führer, this man of destiny, this kind of Wagnerian hero, he can't sit down with all the frock coated pygmies. (laughs) <laughs> and behave like exactly. any other politician. Exactly right. I think you're absolutely right, Tom. I think um, if he if he's got this sacred destiny to lead Germany into a national revolution, how can you do that if you're sitting with the very yeah, people? So he st- he starts to have secret talks with General Schleicher about doing a deal and becoming Chancellor. But for various reasons, those this is in August 1932. For various reasons, those talks run aground. One reason is that there's yet more extreme street violence. Parpin has just announced the death penalty for all political crimes, basically to use with, against with communists. Axe, with a, Presumably with, with an axe, fashion, yes. Prussian axe. Um, he means this so that's to, something to cheer the traditionalists up. Just to, yeah. To try, the letter writers to the Daily Telegraph will be delighted with that. <laughs> um, Parpin wants this, uh, he tends to use this against the communists. However, the first crime that happens within hours of the law being passed is a load of Nazi brown shirts killing a communist in an upper Silesian village. And five of them are sentenced to death. 
Hitler goes absolutely mad and says, how can you work with the, how can I work with anybody who sentences our people to death? They're not criminals. They're, they're fighting for the fatherland. Against this background, Hindenburg, Hindenburg still has slightly cold feet about dealing with it. I mean, Hindenburg is, what did I say last time he was 84? Now he's, I mean, he's, he's 85, <laughs> 90, going on 127. <laughs> yeah. He's still a bit iffy about this. He has a key meeting on the 13th of August, 1932, with Hitler, the presidential palace. He says, I want you to serve under Franz von Papen. Hitler says, no, 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 I want to be chancellor. I have to be chancellor. I'm leading the biggest party. And Hindenburg says, no. And, and he says something which, you know, he should say. He says, I will not hand over um, the Reich to one party that is so intolerant and that encourages violence. I, I will not do it. And the meeting lasts just 20 minutes, and Hitler goes out, furious that Hindenburg has said no. It's, that meeting is largely forgotten today. In his biography, Ian Kershaw says, that should have been that yet again. That was Hitler's chance, and it was gone. Is that when Hitler plunges into his big depression? I think, well, yeah, I guess he does plunge into a big depression then, yes. Because he mean, feels he's, he's had his chance and it slipped through and his fingers. And, and, it's, and yeah, and he's blown it. Well, it's not that he's blown it, it's that... The one man he, that he couldn't circumvent, the war hero, the one man who really is, you know, the guardian of the constitution. If he can't persuade Hindenburg to give him a chance, he has no hope unless he sort of kills Hindenburg or, or something or Hindenburg waits till he's dead. But if he waits till he's dead, Germany will have recovered from the depression by then or be in the recovery and the Nazis momentum will have passed. So you, that should be that for Hitler, but of course it isn't. So what happens next is pure intrigue. Um, Papen has a plan that he will, let's just dissolve the Reichstag forever. Let's just get rid and use uh, Hindenburg's presidential emergency powers to rule by decree. And that will pave the way for an authoritarian regime that we've always dreamed of, that we've wanted since 1918. There's an incredible moment. It's pure parliamentary drama. Von Papen goes to the Reichstag on the 12th of September, 1932, to dissolve it, to basically set this in train. But before he can do that, the communists place a vote of no confidence in the government. And to Von Papen's horror and fury, the Nazis, the biggest party who, can, who are basically running it, so Goering is the sort of president of the session, Goering says, we'll vote on the no confidence thing first. They vote on it, and they, the no confidence wins by 512 votes to 42. So Papen and his government are completely... Okay. Well, that's a, a ringing defeat, isn't it? Yeah, a very ringing defeat. They're completely humiliated. How can you now dissolve it and rule by decree when you've been so completely rebuked and it's shown that you have no, no democratic legitimacy at all? And so Papen and co, they, they kind of lose their bottle. And yet again, they say, well, we'll have another election. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll bang my head against this door again. Everybody is sick of elections by now. Actually, the Nazis now are beginning to drop. This is the incredible thing, Tom. The Nazis took power after they were yeah. dropping. Yeah. Their vote drops from 13.7 million votes to 12.7 million. They lose 44 seats. They are still the biggest party, but now they are smaller than the Social Democrats and the Communists combined. The Communists are going up all the time, by the way. They're now up to 100. But the communists and the social democrats won't work with each other. They'll never work together. They hate each other. More than they hate the Nazis. Well, is it more than they hate the Nazis? As much as. I think it's yeah. certainly fair to say. So what happens now? Total stasis. Nobody knows. And just pure factionalism. So Papen and Schleicher. So the effete Machiavel and the intriguing general. They've kind of fallen out with each other. They both want to be running Germany. They're more interested basically in their own personal fortunes than they are in thinking about what the Nazis truly represent. Schleicher says to Papen, you've got to go, mate. The army's not going to back you anymore. So Papen resigns. There's then two weeks of sort of general intrigue. Finally, Schleicher, the general, takes on the chancellorship himself. It's not really what he wanted. I think he wanted a puppet to do it for him. Hindenburg by now is very distrustful of General Schleicher. He thinks mm, General Schleicher has been plotting against Papen all this time. Schleicher opens talks with the Nazis. Uh, he appeals to Hitler's, I suppose you could say almost Hitler's rival within the Nazi party, Gregor Strasser, who's tempted. It's such to a dangerous thing to be. Very dangerous thing to be, as, General, as Gregor Strasser will discover. Strasser is tempted. 
Uh, but the Nazis say, no, you can't go into, you can't do this without Hitler. So he ends up resigning all his posts and leaving the Nazi party. Inside the Hindenburg circle, there are all talks the whole time. What on earth are we going to do? Who's going to run the country? And there are lots of conservatives around Hindenburg who say, you can't trust General Schleicher. You know, von Papen was quite good. Get him back. You know, more of the stuff with the axe. Bring, <laughs> I mean, he's conservative. We can trust so him. They never, work think, with him. they never think, why don't we bring the Kaiser back? No, I think the Kaiser is completely... Uh, so he's off in Holland, isn't he? He's off in Holland, becoming very anti-Semitic. Well, there's so the Kaiser, who previously, in his previous appearances and the rest is history, has been very much a comic figure. Um, I think it's fair to say that against this backdrop, it's hard to see him in quite the same entertaining light as, uh, as previously. So the Hindenburg Circle decide, OK, let's talk to the Nazis after all. And they do it through a pre the press baron, Alfred Hugenberg, nationalist press baron, who I talked about in the previous podcast. Von Papen is the, you know, this great intriguer. He is the key figure. They have talks with Hitler and they say, maybe we'll put you in as chancellor after all. But most of your cabinet have to be conservatives, not Nazis. Meanwhile, they hear talks that Schleicher may be, General Schleicher may be planning some sort of coup. So they're very exercised by this. They say, we must hurry, we must hurry. We must get, you know, we must sort this out so that, Schleicher doesn't get in, in instead. I mean, it's pure court politics. The ideological divisions between yeah. Hindenburg, yeah. Papen, and Schleicher are minimal. It's all Game of Thrones. Yeah, it's very Game of Thrones. And and Ian Kershaw says in his um, biography, you know, even at this point, if they had basically stopped intriguing against each other, if Hindenburg had just said, "Listen, this is a shambles. Let's dissolve the Reichstag. Go on, Schleicher, have a go. Run the country. Rearm. Do what you like. Be a bit authoritarian." The Nazi regime could have been averted. But again, they don't know. No. Schleicher that thinks, is a worse alternative. No, they don't. Because Schleicher thinks, you know what? The Nazis maybe aren't so bad. I'll probably end up running the army. The Italy army will run things anyway. So, you know, who cares? Yeah. And von Papen, he is convinced that he's been chancellor already. He thinks, you know, Hitler, this two-bit Austrian, it's fine. I'll, run th I'll be his vice chancellor and I'll run things. And the cabinet will be full of my friends. So it is that on the 22nd of January, uh, 1933, there is a crucial secret meeting between Hitler and Papen and Hindenburg's son, Oscar. It's at that meeting they do the deal and they agree that Hitler will be the chancellor and Papen will be his deputy. And Dominic, do you know what else happens on the 22nd of January, 1933? Is it some test match? No. Hitler goes to the grave of Horst Vessel. Because he hadn't, Hitler had not gone to Horst Wessel's funeral, but he goes to his grave and he addresses a memorial service in the evening. And they play the funeral march from Gotterdammerung, from Wagner. And they have uh, the stage is all set with laurel trees, with candelabras, and with a huge, larger than life size portrait of Wessel. So even as he is doing his kind of, you know, behind the scenes shenanigans and all that kind of stuff, he is also out on the public stage promoting this this Nazi martyr. Well, doesn't that capture something about the Nazi rise to power? That it's the combination of the back stairs, back yeah, room, absolutely. intriguing. Yeah. And then these sort of lurid, pseudo-religious theatrical spectacles. So, yeah, so with that, so from that moment, the, the deal is done. And on the 30th of January, uh, Hitler goes into Hindenburg's apartment at the Reich Chancellery. Wilhelmstrasse, if you remember from the first episode, yeah, very, the very palace first thing, yeah, renovated, and they do the deal, and Hindenburg says, and, and now, gentlemen, forwards with God, and um, somebody says to von Papen about that time, how can you work with these vulgar, stupid, utterly inexperienced, extremely violent, sort of common men, thugs, thugs, and Papen says, you are wrong. We've hired him and how wrong he was. Okay. So thank you, Dominic. We will look at the Reichstag fire and how Hitler outsmarts Papen and Hindenburg and everybody and establishes his regime until he ends up dead outside his bunker in 1945. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Rest is History. For bonus episodes, early access, ad-free listening, 
and access to our chat community, please sign up at restishistorypod.com. That's restishistorypod.com. Thank you.